I did it. I fixed the RFI problems I was having with the CNC plasma cutter. So in this video, I'm going to run you through the previous configuration real quick, and I'm going to show you the changes I made. So one of the first things I did was I replaced the plastic box that was on the back of the Y-axis with uh, this metal project case. All of the leads from the motors and from the limit switches are looped through various ferrite beads that I've collected over the years before they go into this terminal block. This terminal block was something I stripped out of my uh, Bridgeport CNC machine when I converted it to uh, run on Mach 3 in a PC. And then these connections all go into this cable. This is an 18 conductor shielded cable specifically made for automation and mechanical controls. I did have to buy this. I didn't have anything in stock. Uh, usually I try to use absolutely everything I possibly can from my uh, my junk bin, but the idea of stringing together and then shielding 18 conductors into some sort of monstrosity of a cable uh, uh, didn't appeal to me. So uh, so I did order this. It was uh, I think it was about $5 a foot and I ordered 10 feet. So my, my total cost for this machine is uh, it's increased by about uh, $50. The next part of the process was to take all of the electronics that were in that plastic box and put them in a metal box. This particular chassis, this uh, came from a company I used to work for. I think it held a spectrometer of some sort. It's a nice heavy-duty aluminum case. And let's take a look inside. So. Everything I possibly could I put inside this case, including the power supply for the laptop and the main power supply that drives the stepper motors. So let's unplug the laptop and take the cover off. And what we have inside is we've got our X, Y, and Z stepper controllers. Down at the bottom we've got the 24 volt power supply. We've got a 24 volt fan here. The power supply for the laptop is down there. And this is the USB uh, Mach 3 controller card. So I actually looked up some of the prices of these on uh, on Amazon. And uh, the controller card is about $20. And these stepper motors, if you buy four of them at once, these are $10 each. So, so my electronics are actually cheaper than originally I thought they were. On this box, the wires that come in and out of the box, I've added uh, ferrite cores here and here. The... Mach 3 controller also has some uh, additional shielding by virtue of the fact that it's on this suspended plate. Let me take this plate off and show you the uh, the filter capacitors at the bottom. There, down at the bottom, those are the arrays of filter capacitors. Every single lead from the cable that comes from the plasma table connects through these boards and these little tiny capacitors here. These are 4700 uh, picofarad uh, capacitors and they connect each and every single one of these wires to ground. So any high frequency AC that comes in on any of these wires gets shorted to ground by those capacitors. And I think these filter capacitors are the key to the success of this configuration. Okay, let's talk about how I beat my RFI problem. So when you have an RFI issue, there are three main ways to address it. Number one is shielding. And what you do there is you basically put everything in a metal box and wherever you have conductors going in and out of the box, you use shielded conductors. Second thing you wanna do is proper grounding. And this gets a little bit tricky with my setup because I had my table with my fan and then I had a cable that ran from there to my controller box 
with my PC on top of it. And I had a 220 volt line to the plasma cutter, and then I had a 110 volt line to the controllers. So the key thing here, and the key thing you want to remember with grounding, is from any point there should be only one path to ground. So if we look at the way this is set up uh, schematically, here's my pl plasma cutter. It is grounded. Then I've got my XYZ motors and some attendant switches and stuff. They have cables that all go back to the controller box. And then this cable is shielded, but the shield is connected to my controller box. It is not connected to any ground here. If I had connected it, then I would create a ground loop, this part of the loop being completed through my house electrics, and this part being uh, completed by the shielding on the cable. And that's bad. That sets up voltage differentials and, and leads to uh, interference. So when you are designing your ground, all your components, so in my case, I've got my plasma cutter. It goes to the house ground. I've got my controller box, which goes to the house ground. And then inside my controller box, I've got my XYZ stepper motor controllers. I've got my USB. I've got my um, power supply for power power supply for the laptop, and the grounds from all of these devices go to the same point, which is the case which connects to ground. Everything has just a single path to my ultimate ground. I never create any loops between any of these components, and that's key for proper grounding. The third way you attack RFI is filters, and I'm using two methods of filtering. One method is these ferrite beads that are on all of the stepper cables in the box on the back of the plasma table. I've also got ferrite beads on the wires that go into the controller box. These are good for basically soaking up the, the RFI interference that might be riding those wires into the, the controller box. The other type of filter that I have are these capacitor arrays. And these are basically little pieces of perf board. And I've put terminal blocks on either side. And the terminal blocks just connect one to the other. And then there's a 4700 picofarad capacitor, which connects each and every one of these connections to ground. Any high frequency energy on these wires will see that capacitor as a short to ground. And the uh, DC voltages that are on these wires will ignore the capacitors completely. The very small value of the capacitors means it's only conductive for very high frequencies. So all of the lines coming into the control controller box from the plasma table have these capacitors coupling them to ground to filter out any incoming RF. And I think that it's these capacitor filters that made the most difference. Okay, so now let's talk about CAMBAM and the tool chain I use for creating the parts. CAMBAM is this really nice 2.5D drawing and computer aided manufacturing program. It's simple to use. It does not cost a whole lot. I don't remember exactly. I feel like it was like 49 bucks, something like that. Maybe it was $149. Not super expensive. So far it has done absolutely everything that I've needed it to. It does CAM operations. It, it will even do 3D profiling. If you import an STL file, you can then carve 3D profiles. There are a couple of changes that you need to make to CAMBAM to use it for plasma cutting. If you uh, search on CAMBAM and plasma, it will take you to this page at, at the CAMBAM.info site. Here you'll find a set of resource files that you can download and add to CAMBAM to set it up for plasma cutting. There's some key differences between plasma cutting and using CAMBAM for a milling machine. Probably the biggest difference is in a milling machine, you turn the spindle on, the tool comes up to speed, you do all your cutting, you retract from the, the part, spindle turns off. Plasma, you're turning the spindle the torch on and off as you're cutting each of the different features in your part. Of these three files that you download from CAMBAM, this is the key one. This is the post-processor definition file. In here, there's a couple of things that you'll need to change. If you have a floating carriage like I do for my torch head, you'll need to measure the difference between when it contacts the workpiece and triggers the probe switch, and when the head comes clear of the workpiece when the Z-axis 
lifts. And for me, that's about three quarters of an inch. That's something everybody will have to change in this file. The other thing, and this is the trick that I did because my torch is a high frequency start torch and not a pilot arc torch. The difference is a pilot arc torch turns on without being in contact with the work, whereas a high frequency starch torch must be touching the workpiece for it to turn on. And the way I address this is I simply changed my pierce height to zero. So when my plasma cutter starts its cycle, it probes the height of the metal, lifts back up, and then before it starts a cut, it goes to the pierce height. And in this case, the pierce height is set to zero, which means the torch is touching the workpiece. Turns on the torch, pierces the hole. The torch then lifts the fraction of an inch or so to cutting height, does its cut, turns off, goes to the next place, drops to the workpiece because that pierce height is zero, turns on, makes its cut. And that's working really well. And it means I don't have to do any hand editing of the G-code. I can just produce the G-code in Kanban, send it to the machine, and it cuts. The other two files that you get from Kanban are a, a CB file, a part file. And this is basically a template. Uh, and it has the, the various things like cut height and, uh, and target depth already in it. So as you create your machining operations, that just is inherited from the machining operations already programmed into the file. And the third is a uh, style file for plasma cutting that has some specific styles and things like uh, lead-in cuts and lead-out cuts, which is nice because it means that the G-code automatically pierces outside or inside of your profile so you don't get a little discontinuity where that pierce was. Uh, it makes nice clean uh, uh, cuts. One of the other things that I did is these files were all metric. Kanban defaults to metric and uh, I like to work in inches. So I went through them and converted all of the parameters inside to reasonable inch equivalents. In the template file one of the things that took me a little while to figure out was uh, this very first line, CAD file. At the end of it, you have to add units equals inches. Otherwise, it's going to default to metric. So going back to the high frequency start versus pilot arc, I do want to convert this torch to pilot arc. I think someone down in the comments uh, mentioned the same thing. And I went looking on YouTube how you do this. My Simadre plasma torch is basically a cut 50 torch in a slightly fancier case. It's a very basic Chinese made 50 amp plasma cutter. And it's worked great for several years. I, I've had no problems with it uh, whatsoever. Consumables are cheap. Uh, it just works. So I went looking on YouTube to see if it was possible to convert a high frequency start torch to a pilot art torch. And I did find a lot of videos, people claiming to have uh, done so, um, but honestly, I think they're mostly bullshit. What they generally have you do is add a wire to the torch or buy a pilot arc torch that already has a wire in it. And then they add a connection from that pilot arc wire to the ground clamp. And sure enough, when you pull the trigger, you get an R, you get a uh, plasma jet out the end of the torch and it will cut. But real pilot arc machines have circuitry inside of them that transfer the cutting current from the pilot arc wire to the workpiece. And that's something that's missing in these YouTube videos. While these seem to work and they seem to work on video, I don't believe that those plasma cutters have anywhere near the capacity they used to before they were converted because they don't they're not going to transfer 100% of that current to the workpiece. Some of that current's going to be bled off by that pilot arc wire. Now, I do think it is possible to convert it, but I think some circuitry has to be built and some components added to the plasma cutter. And I think I'm going to do that in an upcoming video because I have an idea about how to do that. And I do want to add pilot arc to this unit because that's useful for, for piercing, especially thicker materials. Also, starting the torch the way I do with it directly on the metal shortens the lifetime of the consumables. And then finally, I want to add torch height control. So I do have plans for those and there'll be an upcoming video, but things are working great right now.